Good morning, everybody. I'm Diane Benson. I'm the president of this wonderful Longhouse. And on behalf of all of us, we welcome you wholeheartedly. This is a very interesting, diverse, and welcome group here today. And we are thrilled that Tony has made this great installation here and that she has instituted this program, which I hope will continue. I hope this is not the end of it. Um, anyway, welcome, 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 and enjoy your day here. You know, after this is over, there's all sorts of things to see and do on the grounds, and we have a special sale in our little store, too. So <coughs> That's good. So now I will, yes, exactly, exactly. And, um, and now, Tony will introduce her wonderful panelists, and we will have a very invigorating morning. <laughs> wow. OK, first of all, thank you so much. Diane, this has been really an extraordinary experience. I think everybody at Longhouse um, um, especially Jack Leonard Larson, whose place this is. He couldn't be here today. He's being honored um, elsewhere, um, much deserved. Um, Peter Olson, Matko Tomicic, who um, I probably drove insane, but he has been really <laughs> very patient and extraordinary. And um, I thank Longhouse for taking the leap of faith um, in inviting me to do this with these particular materials. Thank you to Alex, the head gardener here, who's really extraordinary, and to Wendy Van Dusen, who's really been a tremendous friend. Um, I just, um, I'm stunned by how many people are here today. I mean, I know how great these panels are, and some of you have been before. I'm supposing some of you have um, heard through word of mouth. But um, these have been really extraordinary groups of women, and I'm incredibly proud to um, to have these women here today, some of whom I've just recently met and some who are very close, longtime friends of mine. And um, uh, I thank you all for being here. It's September, and there's over 100 people here. I'm, I'm blown away. Um, I would also like to um, thank the underwriters, um, some of whom are here today. Without your support, this would absolutely not have happened. I thank Alpine Capital Bank, um, the Abudi and Hoffman families especially, and thank you very much, David, um, to Integrated Exercise Therapy in Bridgehampton. If you've never been there, you need to check it out. Um, Tag Associates, and uh, to Sherry Sandler, who's also here today, Neda Young, Dorothy Lichtenstein, and um, also a special thanks to the Rico Moresca Gallery and uh, Stephen and Sandy Pearl Pearlbinder, who helped to underwrite the installation itself. Um, I'd also like to just remind everyone uh, to turn off their phones. And even if you thought you turned it off, just like check it again. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and also to mention again, though it's in the program, that this um, series is dedicated to Elaine de Kooning who was an extraordinary mentor of mine. And I think without her encouragement, I'm not sure that I'd be here doing this today. Um, so Pernilla will introduce the other panelists, but I just wanted to say a few words about Pernilla, who I have recently met and have, I'm already in love with. Um, uh, Pernilla has an MA in History of Art from the Courtauld Institute of Art. She's a curator, advisor, and a writer, having written gallery and museum catalog texts, as well as articles for publications such as the Financial Times, Newsweek, Art Review, and Art News. She's given numerous talks and panel discussions at numerous prestigious art venues. Um, you can see some of them in her bio in the program. And has been the director of Vital, Vital? Vital. Vital, sorry. Vital Art and Art Advisory Firm since 2010. Pernilla works closely with both established and emerging artists. Again, some of them listed in the program, Theaster Gates being one of my really favorite artists, and works on building collections and new approaches to art philanthropy. She's currently co-curator co of the Arts Club 
London's exhibition program and is co-curating a show of 60s and 70s abstract painting this November at the Pace Gallery in London. She has a current article in Freeze Magazine work, um, about what? Oh, sorry, no, she knows it's actually the Pace show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, about Souls Grown Deep at the Tate Modern that she calls a revelatory exhibition cementing a rising appreciation for African American art. Um, and that show is actually going to be traveling to the United States. It's going to be um, in... Uh, at the Brooklyn Museum and then at Cisco Bridges. Yeah. Right, so I'd encourage everybody to see that. And um, I just want to thank each of you for being here. I'm really moved. Um, by your um, making time to do this. You all have extraordinarily busy schedules, and I respect all of your work so much, and I look forward to the conversation. Okay, well, thank you so much for that, um, that really nice introduction. And I just want to quickly say, first of all, thank you so much to Tony for organizing this really important series on women artists, also for this very beautiful installation that's surrounding us, which I must say creates um, a sort of extraordinary atmosphere for doing a talk. Um, and also thanks so much to the Longhouse for, um, for hosting us um, again on what I think is a really important series. I missed the first two, um, but um, I'm really excited about the, the extraordinary women I have up here with me today. So this is um, Bastian Schmidt, who is based um, out here in the Hamptons currently, but has grown up um, a, as a sort of international citizen, I'd say, in Greece and Italy and Germany, um, all of which I think informs her practice. Um, she has a long CV, so I'm not gonna, going to read out, but she's shown quite extensively internationally, both with museums and galleries, um, and is working with sort of photography and installation um, and we'll, we'll dig down a little bit into what all that sort of means. Um, this is Almond Zygmunt, who's also based here at the moment, grew up in Brooklyn, but I think also has lived in a few places, um, and uh, is working with, well, installation and sort of object-based sculpture and kind of uh, geometric um, patterning, as well as works on paper. Um, she also has a very uh, illustrious CV and has worked with such um, interesting curators as and writers, as my personal favorite, Dave Hickey, um, Andrea Grover, uh, Robert Storr, and David Pagel, among many others. So thank you, Omen. And Zina Sarawiwa, um, who I have had the good fortune of knowing for about 10 years, um, is a British Nigerian artist who's now based in Brooklyn, um, working primarily with video art, although I hear there's new things happening in the studio. <laughs> Um, she's recently become a Guggenheim Fellow, which is a great honor, um, and has shown at the Guggenheim, at Tate, at uh, the Pulitzer. I think she has work coming up at Prospect New Orleans. Um, and then also, uh, we might get into a little bit today, so I'll mention it. Um, Zina also um, has a curatorial practice and uh, founded a gallery in Port Harcourt in Nigeria, um, where she's doing very important shows, I think, largely with local artists, but also some international. Um, does that introduce... Everyone? Okay, so a little bit, um, hopefully we're going to have a nice organic conversation and nothing too, um, too well, very serious, but not too seriously structured anyway. Um, but what I'd really like to do is dig down into these wonderful artist practices a little bit and then maybe um, get into questions of what it means to be a woman artist and, and how that impacts um, reception and practice. Um, so I think to start out with, maybe we can sort of um, address more generally with each artist what made you want to be an artist and maybe how a little bit how that manifests itself in your practice maybe if we start with Bastian hi can you hear me sorry um, well I think it's not really a choice to become an artist I think one is an artist I remember since I was eight years old probably living in Greece it was just like the desire to to observe and then to document things and then to think how it connects in a bigger way. And I think uh, also going up in these different countries like Greece and Italy, uh, Germany and America facilitated that approach that I really could collect from different systems and make observations and uh, just reflect them through my practice. 
So I think for me it was an organic process, and I never had a doubt about what else I should have been doing. It was just like one road, which is like to be an artist. Um, I kind of, I, I chose to be an artist. Actually, I did not choose to not be an artist. I actually, I, I um, came to it kicking and screaming, and I actually, when growing up, I swore up and down that I would not be an artist. Um, both of my parents um, lived in that world, and growing up in that world was difficult, um, as some you, some of you may um, have experienced yourselves, and I, I really, I had decided early on that I wasn't going to follow in their footsteps, and every decision I made along the way brought me closer to being an artist, and so Pernilla asked us that question um, earlier, and I, yeah, my choice, or my answer was uh, echoed Bastian's, which was, it wasn't really a choice, it just kind of happened, sort of against my will, almost, and um, it, yeah, so here I am, <laughs> 30 <laughs> years later. Um, hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> um, I think I became an artist in order to um, um, take control of a form of storytelling. Um, I used to work at the BBC as a presenter and a producer, and, um, you know, obviously was a, some form of storyteller there, and then, and I come from a family of writers. But, um, um, I feel like art, and it, it showed me, it kind of chose me, I know all artists say that, but it's true, it chose me, because it said, well, actually, you have more freedom here. You can tell stories in the way that you want to tell them here. And so that's what art afforded me. It excited me that I could, um, I wanted to do something about my father, and, you know, there was a usual path of documentaries to tell, you know, tell a story, and I had to go to different um, production companies and pitch stories, and I had to write out a and I couldn't ever get through a meeting without crying, <laughs> which is really embarrassing. And, um, and it was really weird because I couldn't get together a documentary idea. And then what, what it ended up being was um, I ended up making an art, a performance art piece where I shaved my head and forced myself to cry for my father because I hadn't been able to cry about his death. And that was my documentary. That was it. And which shows you that form and process and they're sort of collapsed in some way. And there is a viable option. There is a viable way to, you know, to make that work and to show that work, and that's within the art world. So um, I was freer. I, I was looking for freedom, um, for storytelling, and you know, art happened to say, well, actually, you can do whatever the hell you want here. And so that's why I became an artist. I was looking for a form of freedom when it comes to storytelling. That's such a nice answer. Maybe we can um, dig down a little bit also with descriptions of that. So we, you brought up the crying work. And in fact, Zina then went on to make a series of videos of um, women crying on camera. Um, sort of, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you got into, I mean, that sounds like a start of it and, yeah. and, and yeah. what those mean. Um, so like my first outing into art wasn't actually that crying piece, but it was, um, about the Nollywood film industry, which is the second largest film industry in the world. It comes from Nigeria. It's kind of like a, a B-movie industry, sort of, um, uh, what would you call it? It's a, uh, anyway, it's a kind of bleak, schlocky, kind of awful kind of <laughs> filmmaking, but very, very popular. Um, but I was very interested in, in it. And the South African photographer, Peter Hugo, had done a very interesting series about um, Nollywood, and I wrote the essay for it. And it was a really interesting thing, actually, because um, one of my first art outings was at um, Location One in Soho. And I was literally offered a show. It's like, you can do a show of whatever you want. And I was like, well, okay. And I, um, so I made some work, a video, and I curated as well. And it seems like a weird thing, like the first outing I ever had is to like curate like one Getchi movie and McLean Thomas and Peter Hugo into a show. And also to make work myself. I'd nev never made artwork before. I just sort of spontaneously created work. So that was a crying piece and two uh, experimental film pieces. And um, I often wonder, where did that come from? Because I'd never made art before and I'd never curated before. But actually, because I'd written an essay for Peter's monograph, um, it's a really interesting thing where you see, OK, fine, I wrote a very straightforward essay that established my cognitive relationship with something called Noll Nollywood. And that's one way of exploring something. But then what art does, it allows you to, first of all, the, the essay located my emotions about about it and sort of like anchored it but then there's so much more space for the things that i couldn't capture and the things that i couldn't write down but once you've isolated all those 
areas, that's where art can come in and can describe it. And so um, the work I made, the crying work, um, because there's a lot of women crying and close-ups, you have this in soap operas and telenovelas as well, like, you know, the close-up of the woman, like, and that, that kind of really um, affected me somehow. And I sort of homed in on that and asked a bunch of actresses to cry for the camera because I was interested in the space between performance and um, reality and performance, I suppose. What is real and what is performed? And is performance dishonest in any way? It doesn't have to be dishonest. It can be the truth. Actually, a lot of authenticity can be expressed through performance. And in terms of grieving, catharsis can occur through performing grief. So I couldn't access my emotions about my father's death. And so to perform grief actually drew it out. But was it real or was it not real? And those kinds of questions, that liminal space always interested me and art allows you to like yeah. make work that expands within that kind of, um, in between that space. Yeah. Um, Ahmed, I was really interested in looking through your work in, in your relationship with pattern. Um, and how you've used pattern in the work and sort of interpreted what it means. I wonder if we could dig down a little bit into that. Sure. Um, I've, I've my, my interest in pattern and um, use of it has... Uh, um, hearing what Zena is talking about in terms of performance and reality, um, it, I'm using that, kind of drawing it into my own practice and... Um, and it really is interesting that the, the freedom to kind of um, take to take things across history and across um, uh, sort of a landscape and to bring them into your work and to have the freedom to be able to sort of manipulate um, and and draw out your experience of them. Um, pattern for me has kind of become that um, where I can kind of sort of look at a landscape of um, um, of um, form and and history that is kind of written into pattern um, and a sort of unspoken language and extract from that and use it um, to to my own end and to kind of create a theater of um, of form and relationship and space and that's that's kind of why I find um, for me pattern to be sort of a, one of the more interesting. Uh, reference. So that that's kind of one of my, yeah. <laughs> um, Bastian, that sort of segues into your, I think you have a very um, kind of beautiful relationship with sort of identity and ideas of, you know, identity and home um, in your work. Also actually access a little bit through pattern in some ways. You have, um, as well as the sort of long-term kind of series that are uh, long-term projects that you sort of engage with. Yeah, I think I'm interested in the idea of um, identity in place in a long-term kind of view. And on one hand, uh, one of my projects is called Home Stealth, where I put myself in a conceptual setting as a quote-unquote um, woman or housewife in these different um, places. Could be my own home or along the old 27 and these um, in front of old shopping malls. And sometimes I incorporated my younger, one of our children in it when he was younger, Julian. And the whole point was uh, to act out kind of a private performance in public and private spaces and really relook through history of art, also the placement of women in the context of public and private life. One of my sources of inspiration was uh, um, the Dutch and Flemish painters who uh, depicted like uh, with great detail uh, domestic life and where the window was really this kind of connection between the outside and the inside with a sense of longing of women to be part of a public life where we're in reality they were not allowed to. But there was also a twist in irony in my project. And the irony was that, that the woman uh, was always a step away from hopping into a car and driving away. And that was like, goes back to a Wim Wenders movie where uh, the male hero basically could step out of the picture and drive away. And a lot of times in uh, Hollywood movies in real life, women are not allowed the choice or they would never do that choice because of responsibilities for house and children. So I feel in my bigger scale of work, what I really like to draw is an arch between the personal, experiential, but also the universal. But going back to my very first project, which was about death rituals, where I really incorporated very harsh moments of reality 
like photographing in mosques and uh, witnessing rituals in cemeteries, I want to show that you can also show the other side of life, which is like maybe through the domestic lens, but in a really up close that you really see how things can be. I mean, this taps into, you know, we're talking about women artists today um, and this kind of idea of, of women's materials and the domestic sphere, which um, often uh, certainly aren't historically get associated with women. Um, and maybe it's interesting to think a little bit, uh, Zena, you've worked a lot with food, both in making meals as part of your practice, but also filming how people eat. And um, maybe it's interesting to think a little bit about what women's materials, what that sort of means um, in, in work. I know you've, we've talked a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, again, materiality is universal. But then again, certain materials are more associated with uh, women's tasks, like um, things like cloth or textiles or threads. But then again, um, man, man, man had to use uh, uh, sails and they had to make their own sails when they went out on the whaling boats, for example. So it can go both ways. I think for me, it's like uh, working with a material that feels like innate to you, that you have a relationship with, and push it uh, to a certain boundary. And what I'm interested in is uh, um, materials that have a certain kind of vulnerability and flexibility. So threads and cloth uh, fall really well into the spectrum. Almond, do you want to? Yeah, I think when when I was in graduate school or undergraduate school, rather, I, I chose materials very specifically to reflect um, a, a, a kind of a narrative, and I think that the pattern was part of that. And they really did, like Bastian said, like speak of sort of women's work. I, I used a lot of um, napkins and um, and uh, um, table covers, and and there was really a very specific connection that I was trying to make with um, the idea of, of the feminine and the, the work that I was doing and you know whether or not that was successful I don't know but um, it was it was a very intentional connection that I was trying to make but as I have um, progressed I've, I've really sort of stepped away from the idea of um, working within a narrative and I've, I've really kind of tried to um, to engage with materials on an intuitive um, and even formal basis um, to try to take out the pathos that might be associated um, with something. And I guess, you know, part of that is this idea of really wanting to explore form without the, um, the hegemony of language on top of it. Um, and maybe part of that goes back to the freedom that art allows you and that kind of allows you to sort of step away from any narrative that might be trying to be imposed upon your work and really just see it for what it is. And, um, you know, whenever I'm kind of faced with the idea that somebody, you know, wants to make that connection, um, I kind of, you know, I sort of nod my head and say, well, that's okay. <laughs> but that's your connection, not necessarily mine. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, so many things to say. I feel like um, you're talking about the domestic, and um, I'm, we're talking about food, so I have to put that together. The idea of, um, you know, women, I work with food, but, um, you know, is food a female materialist material and endeavor? But, you know, there's that, you know, the, the, the domestic sphere, like women cooking at home, and then there's the professional chefs who are often men. So, you know, there's that. So I'm thinking, what is the difference between like women's endeavor and male endeavor? If you're going to really just be very essentialist, and let's say, so let's just be essentialist today, because I think they can be quite useful in terms of trying to figure things out. So, um, you know, the domestic as so being an artist and making work about food does that make you know is that a female or is that a very male endeavor? I don't know. Um, it's interesting to think about, but I feel that you know using food is elemental and important. Like I feel like I I need to use it as a language to to enact something, so that's why I use food. Um, but thinking of it in terms of, is it as a material? Because I don't work with, my work as a, as a video artist, it's not so tactile, and I feel a bit sensitive about that these days. I'm trying to move more into something that's a bit more tactile and use, ma use the materials, not just a camera and a video you know, and a computer. Can, can you describe, I just for maybe if, if not everyone's familiar with the work, can you describe a little bit the um, table oh. manners um, yeah. 
I mean, I've been to one of Gina's sort of art dinners where she's cooked um, fusion, African fusion yeah. food, what do you say? Bringing a little, sharing culture, bringing your own flair, et cetera, um, but also yeah. creating this sort of very warm, conversational, um, kind of quite performative space for everyone to sit in. But um, I think just to understand. Sure. Um, so um, I mean, I'll locate it in my more recent practice, which is I'm working in the Niger Delta, which is the oil-producing region of Nigeria. And my family is very involved. My father was involved with trying to, um, as an activist, um, protecting our people from the excesses of the oil industry and the, the government, which wasn't developing our land. And um, part of my work there is that I wanted to use food as a tool to sort of talk about the land in a different way and get people to relate to it in a different way. Because, you know, I say the Niger Delta here, but actually it means nothing to most Americans, but a quarter of all American imports oil imports came from the Niger Delta up until 2010. There was a very real relationship between that particular place where I was born. And so but using food, I think, was a way, a really great way of being able to talk about it. And I used it as a material. So I did something called the Mangrove Banquet. We actually staged it at um, Blatter Museum in Texas, and where I had a solo show as well. So this is the per performance aspect of it. And so, yeah, we did like long tables. And I had I printed up some um, napkins that I did in Nigeria. I um, I wanted a very sort of beautiful space, and I made food, um, kind of more my style of food, I suppose, just making, using materials and uh, ingredients from that were local to the Niger Delta, but then turning it into something a little bit more um, sort of performative and um, kind of fancy. So, um, so yeah, so I was using food as a material, as a way to kind of, to get people to ingest an idea. I do believe that when you're ingesting food from a different culture, you're, it's um, something happens to you, actually. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you, know, it's, you can't really explain it necessarily, but I think it's very important to have that. And I think certainly with sub-Saharan African food, there isn't that. We don't have that as a medium to connect. You know, I'm not saying that it destroys strife just because you eat like Japanese food or Thai food that suddenly you're not racist or something. It doesn't matter. It's just something happens to you when you connect culinarily and you're ingesting the food ideas. And so that nearly never happens with sub-Saharan African food, and I wanted to do that. I've done that just more generally with Nigeria, but I also wanted to make that point with the Niger Delta, using food as a, as a point of connection. And also making the point that, you know, our land, you know, in the Niger Delta, people, a lot of them are educated enough to work in the oil industry, and, you know, um, education wasn't um, invested in. So um, our relationship with what in the land is, is very much very distant but our relationship with food, we're farming people and, and fishermen. That relationship is still, you know, potentially very important. And so, yeah, I wanted to make the point about, well, this is a way we still have some sort of um, um, control over our environment in some way. Mm. And, you know, I'm very against sort of trying to talk about the absent victimhood and absence of control. I'm more interested in, well, where, where do we have control? Where do we... Um, where do we have control? I'm not interested, I'm not invested in victimhood. And I actually have to say that doing this panel, I was worried that it would be, uh, I'd have to come up here and talk about my victimhood as a woman artist. And I, I don't feel like a victim, I feel, I feel powerful and I feel lucky. So I wanted to be able, and I'm really thrilled that, you know, we're you know, kind of on the same page with that in a sense. You know, we're engaging with our own power and um, helping describe that. And I think women's work and women's art, or the idea of uh, feminine work or feminine art, is a really interesting paradigm to discuss. And I'm in, I enjoy the different kind of, um, I enjoy masculine and feminine. Um, people might think it's essentialist, but I actually, I think that the tension and the possibilities of like going back and forth and what does this mean, what does that mean? I think it's actually very fruitful. Well, I mean, we could describe a bit more your practice, but maybe we should jump right in to the big issue um, <laughs> about, you know, um, start with the most simple question. How do you feel about the label of woman artist, being a woman artist? I'm fine with anything. I think in the end of the day, I'm an artist and I do whatever I want, I choose to do. I, I feel like it's very free person. So for me, it's not so much about being labeled or not labeled. I just go on my little road and that's it really. I mean, it's an interesting, so what does it mean to be a woman artist? Um, you know, 50% of the population are women, and women are amazing. Um, we should all be proud to be women and, you know, artists. Not me, I'm not an artist, but um, I thought, you know, I jotted down a few statistics in case it maybe became interesting to talk about. Um, so 70% of graduates from art school are women, um, but 70% of 
um, artists represented by gallery are men. So if you think 30% of, of the male graduates are taking up 70% of the gallery space. Um, in terms of, you know, you can think of different ways of measuring success, but of the sort of top 100 um, highest earning artists, five are women. Um, and um, in the last, the Venice Biennale is meant to have the best rate of gender parity of any of the big sort of international exhibitions. And if you look at the statistics in the last three, that was 26%, 34%, 32%. Um, and that's as good as it gets in the big international exhibitions. So there is, there is a bit of baggage that comes with um, the idea of, 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 being a woman, of being a woman artist. And I thought maybe. Yeah, I think that it's, um, we discussed this a little bit before. It's really, it's, there's being a woman artist, and then there's being successful within the paradigm that's set up in terms of the careers. And, and the art world. And that is an economy that is, you can choose to be a part of or not be a part of. And there might be a reason why many women are not, or that the percentages are so low and women are not represented at, um, at, at quite the roots. And that's, I mean, um, but we were also, um, those numbers are representative of auction sales primarily, as well as um, galleries. And there are many different ways that um, there are these microeconomies that exist of women. Um, the, the idea of opportunity was brought up. And you know that's an immeasurable thing. Um, and um, creating, you know, so there's a couple of things going on. There's how do you measure success is, is um, you know, can one have a successful studio practice and artistic practice without being represented in those numbers? And the answer for me is yes. Um, I'm not sure, you know, very much the same way that I'm not that interested in um, in creating my work on the skeleton of a narrative based on language. I'm also not that interested in creating my career on the skeleton based on somebody else's idea of what is successful for me. Um, would I like to make a living off my work? Yes, but um, I am less interested in changing my work to meet the demands of the market than I am in being, you know, to doing what I want and to maintaining that freedom that Zena talked about within um, the context of my studio. Um, and I'm more interested in these other avenues of connection and of, um, and of progress. You know, um, I was saying on the way here that I was overcome by this thought of feeling incredibly privileged um, and incredibly lucky to, um, to be able to have a practice at all, uh, to live where we do, whether out here or in the city, to, you know, we, we live, you know, contrary to um, a lot of, well, I'm not going to talk politics, but we are incredibly lucky. <laughs> Um, all around, and I, you know, and I was overcome with the feeling of responsibility and feeling like, as artists, um, we have an incredible responsibility to reframe the dialogue and to create new narratives, not only politically but also within the context of this, these statistics. Um, and maybe the statistics won't change, but maybe we can change what. Um, what those statistics measure, or you know whether or not that is a measure of success, which I'm not totally willing to say that it is. So um, that's my answer. Zena, woman artist. <laughs> um, what those statistics measure? So interesting. That's a really beautiful way of putting it. I think um, you know when we think thinking about like the art world as an enterprise. You know, I'm always thinking about the fact that all a lot of the big museums were um, established by women. You know, I'm a woman who set up a gallery in Nigeria. And um, yes, and, pa and a lot of those staff are women. I don't know what the statistics on staff are, but yes, it is true a lot of the solo shows are men that show there. But at the same time, to have created these, what I call wombs, these like museums which are wombs, that's, what, that's a, it's quite a big deal to have done that. And I think that's all part of, you know, the exchange of men and women and what the, the work that we've produced to create um, an art world, certainly in the West anyway, at least. Um, woman artist, it's an interesting label. Um, I'm <laughs> so I always ask people this really polarizing and politically incorrect question. Um, going forward, if you could only um, 
engage with and see male art or female art, what would you choose? And they go, well, what do you mean by male art? What do you mean by female art? I'm like, it's up to you to decide. So I, my answer is always I would, I would choose male art. So I'm a bit obsessed. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I've actually recently changed. I went to Chelsea like this week and I saw some things that made me ch help me change my mind. But I'll tell you why. Only because um, I'm wildly jealous of men, wildly jealous of like male artists. Um, the permission that they give themselves, the scale that they operate in. I'm just sort of looking at that and want, I, you know, I want that too. I want some of that too. I, I'm jealous of the, the prices that they work. Commands. I'm jealous. I, you know, I want. I'm jealous. I'm not. In, I don't want to tear them down. I just want it too. You know, I want it too. So, um, woman. I, I'm so happy to be a woman, and I think that my work, certainly in Nigeria, is is about. I, I feel I have to go in there in a slightly aggressive male way, but I'm there to protect something, a sort of more feminine way of engaging. Um, so that it's a weird kind of like relationship between the two. I'm operating and using both the masculine and the feminine in order to activate and protect the feminine, actually. But um, so I, I, I have both masculine and feminine working very powerfully within me. Um, so a woman, yes, I am a woman. So I am a woman artist, but I'm using the feminine and the masculine, both of them, very, very important and powerful for me in terms of what I'm trying to activate. So you're really describing sort of archetypes of femininity and masculinity. Yeah, and I use, and I, I was just saying that I like the word feminine as opposed to female. Um, and I realized that, and I know feminine people, people think, oh, feminine means like through through, but feminine for me means that men can be involved too. It's an archetype, it's a modality. And so I use masculine and feminine as opposed to male and female. That's just my language, so, but, you know. I mean, look, we're all women, so to a certain extent that you bring that with you to whatever you do, but do you, you know, in discussing this, do you feel like there's a sort of feminine perspective um, in, in, in your practice? I'm not sure. I mean, I can only be who I am, and it's, I'm not a man, so I don't know what it feels like. I don't know how I was created. I think we operate with the tools that we have and that we create, and they're based uh, on culture, experience, uh, philosophy. But I do believe we still live in a system where the odds are stacked against us, and I think one needs to spell it out, not to play the victim. But if uh, it's a very closed system that consists of male collectors who uh, support museums who are driven by male trustees uh, who will define the prices uh, of artists, we are part of that loop and we can't, we, we can't get in as women a lot of times. So I'm saying we have to really speak out loud and clear if we want to have any changes to happen. And we're part of that change, but we need to make it a subject. I had dinner with my dealer last night, or somebody that I've had a relationship with for you know, the longest in terms of my professional career. And at some point, she looked at me and she said, Almond, you are the biggest underseller ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so I really relate to you know, what you're saying about, yes, the, the, that permissiveness, the self-permission. You know, I really relate to that idea. I'm actually not sure if it's, um, if it's because I'm a woman, but I know it's because I'm me, and I know she's right. Um, but um, I I don't know what it's like to be a woman artist because I don't know what it's like to be a male artist. I just know what it's like to be me. I don't know what it's like to be Bastien as an artist or to be Zena as an artist. You know, I I mean I know what it's like to be an artist, to be a mother, to be a wife to, you know, to have to do all of those things together to work as well. Um, and, you know, one thing that I will say that I do observe, you know, is that there, um, once you have a child, um, there is something that takes you away from your studio. And I see it less with my friends that are men that are artists they are not so compelled to not go to their studio. Um, so, I mean, that, that being said, I feel like I, I integrate that, as Bastien did with her home stills. You know, it's something that you kind of fold into your life, whether it's scheduling time different or, um, at, yeah, I, I'm not sure that I can, 
that I can say with complete objectivity what it is like to be a woman artist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's a complicated question because yeah. you know, there should be a lot of pride that comes with being a woman, that of course. That being said, yeah. I will say something that I found interesting is that um, oftentimes when people um, approach me without knowing me, if I get an email or something, um, and just and people just look at my work, they often think that I'm a man. And I've often wanted to play with that and, and wonder if there's a little, you know, I, I would be reading into it if I said that there was a certain disappointment when people find out that I'm a woman, but I've always been really curious because to me, my work looks like the work of a woman, but there's, I don't know... Maybe for everyone here, it would be interesting if you just describe a little bit your, um, I mean, I can't, but if you, if you describe maybe a little bit, I'm going to throw it open to questions in just a minute, but I thought maybe it's useful for questions if, when you say that, like maybe describe one, uh, one project or, or exhibition. Um, Sorry, that's a tough one, right? <laughs> or in larger terms. The underseller. Um, <laughs> the... <laughs> I will describe one um, uh, piece that I did, or a project that I worked on with Andrea Grover, I'm sitting here. Um, it was called uh, Interruptions Repeated, and it was a very, two very large structures. One of them was solid, one of them was um, lattice patterned, um, and they were sort of, uh, one was hovering over the other one, kind of balanced, um, and they were about uh, they were made out of plywood. They were about eight feet tall, about 15 feet wide, or long, about seven feet wide. Um, and they kind of, they, they sort of hung together in a kind of um, inverted balance. Um, and they were probably the biggest pieces that I've ever made. Um, and they were really made to react to a very specific space. Um, to fill it up, to have people look up, to have people be sort of threatened and accosted by their um, by their size. Um, I shouldn't say that sounds kind of aggressive, but um, uh, to be jarred, to be put off their center, um, and yeah. <laughs> Said it's very female to worry about it being aggressive. <laughs> it was a quiet aggression. <laughs> Not as <laughs> just as potent. Um, Bastian, I'd love to. I mean, we heard a little bit about the home stills where you did the photographing of a kind of. Well, I was saying we were saying before a photographing of a woman's life. Of course, if a man took photographs of his life, you wouldn't say photographing of a man's life, but photographing of of, of life. But maybe you want to describe um, uh, that series or a different series just to give the audience. I'm just conscious we don't have images, and yeah. so it's nice to have a little bit of a, an idea what we're talking about. Actually, I want to talk to uh, about a space which we also worked in, and together also with Andrea, which was an installation uh, part of the Paris Roadshow project. Uh, which was really interesting because it was a space that uh, Almond had inhabited really well. But I also knew that my practice is so different, so we would go about just with different ways of thinking about the history of the space. Uh, so in my case, uh, I was interested that the architect actually, Lefebvre, he was a French-American uh, architect, and he also built in Staten Island, a place where I used to live. Uh, I had my studio there. And also the history of uh, the objects in the museum, which uh, was um, like a sailing log, which really reminded me of some uh, uh, homemade, self-made books that I made, but also the materiality. So mm -hmm. you had these thick sailing needles, you had the sailing cloth, you had the rope, the strings. So it created these kind of ephemeral uh, objects. One was a, um, a life-size canoe, but made of just of tracing paper and, um, muslin fabric. So it was very light and uh, reinforced with twigs and then I hung it from the ceiling. And then going back to um, this idea of observing my father's work as an archaeologist in Samos, I created these two uh, boxes. On one hand I had objects uh, that I picked specifically from the museum, but then I remade my response to these um, objects that I found. So I made my own books uh, and created um, one was an instrument which was actually used as a way to punish people. It was done out of um, cloth and inside um, and thread, and inside was filled with some metal pebbles or so. 
And uh, so I recreated something out of paper mache. So see, it was more the idea that uh, also men had to really create their own habitats on the boat, and they had to really be uh, female and male in terms of their perception of life. Um, I'd love to throw it open. It's time speeding by. I'd love to throw it open to questions now, if anyone has a question. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you were talking about uh, taking care of the home and children and everything else. Did you find that your work became freer and more creative as the children grew older and your necessary influence was no longer needed? Did you work more? Um, no. <laughs> I, well, I will say that, it, you know, maybe that's, it's yes and no. I, I think that yes, just because I'm older and um, I think as and this is something that we didn't talk about, but I think as as I mature as an artist and I, as I just as I get older, I care less about um, about outside influences. I I you know I I care less. I give myself more permission, and I think that that's something um, that maybe there is an inversion with men and women. You know, um, I think as we grow older. There are constraints that, you know, are lifted. We are, um, at least this is this has been my experience. So, um, you know, there is more freedom because there's more time, um, but there is there there's more permission or self permission. So. I want to say one quick thing. For me, it was just inspiring to have kids. I didn't really know that it would afford me the possibility to have a whole new perspective on things. And it's endless, really. It's, it could be like a stain on a tablecloth, which inspires the next series, um, which makes me think of adversity and the history of stains or so. So it doesn't really matter. I think it's like the way how you look at the world. Mm. And the domestic arena is one way, and the child's perspective is also one way to look at it. So I, I find it fascinating. Didn't, didn't you do a series with toys? Yeah, actually, uh, I mean, um, in my home shows project, but also in my other projects, I play a lot uh, with the idea of a silhouette. And uh, so, but it started initially out when my uh, sons were three and five, and they started collecting these construction worker figures. And then I started hanging them against the window, and I thought, wow, these are really cool silhouettes. And these silhouettes entered my large-scale drawings and became a whole project by itself. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I have a fantasy, and I'm wondering if any of you have a similar fantasy. Um, the UN has decided and made clear that by 2020, they want their staff mem members to be gender equal. De Blasio in New York City has said that he wants agencies um, to move towards diversity. How he's going to um, make that happen, I don't know, but he's made that a goal. What would happen if museums demanded that museums move toward gender equity in their artists, what do you think? Historically, or like try to make it retroactively so, or just now? Well, um, my fantasy is that we would have a lawyer that would take out a class action suit <laughs> and <laughs> demand. I mean, it sounds far-fetched, doesn't it? But it certainly is possible that um, the goal would be toward making um, exhibiting artists in museums um, show equity. That's my fantasy. Sassin, do you want to? Actually, I think it's a very interesting point. I'm not saying you might be able to achieve it, but just to do it, to, to have a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit, would put the question right in front of everyone. And then people have to make a stand. 
and I think a lot of times we have to make our voices be heard loud and clearly. Okay, I'll do it. I'll testify. Do you want to? If you want to come back on this, fifty-fifty in in the museum. Yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> Zena, should we force it to be so? That is a kind of question I'm terrified. Of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can. I'm. I'm going to say I it. It know. sounds great, but you know, I. I don't. I don't know that quotas are the right way to go for anything. You know, I. I'm not sure that. I want to live in a world where somebody's work is up on the wall just because um, they have a vagina. Like I don't know. I don't know that that's what I want to be looking at. The same way that I don't want, um, you know, I'm interested in experience and whatever that experience is and whoever provides it, I'm in. You know, so I I, I don't know. I mean, it sounds great, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, recently there was Nikon that gave out uh, 30 cameras to photographers. And unfortunately, they could not find one female photographer, which is kind of strange. Yeah. Which is also just not representative. There are so many great yeah. female yeah. photographers. Come on, Zena. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do I respond to that? Um, well, I always actually wanted to do a show called The Male Art Show, and then I do another show called The Female Art Show, and just commission probably 50-50 men and women artists to respond to that. So I'll say that. I'd love to see a more flexible situation. I, I want to see it, The Male Art Show and see what comes out of it, and then The Female Art Show. Let's and then do see it. What comes out of it. Let's do it. Right? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do yeah. It. That would then be you'll answer the question. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, well, art, art is like the tool to explore this, isn't it? This is like, this is, for me, it's like, I like to make work about things I don't understand. You know, I don't have a position and then make work from it. It's, you know, it is the tool to understand something. So no, I don't actually know what people mean by men and women all the time. I don't know what that necessarily, I know what that means, but I also don't know what that means, right? So having an art show, in a way, is a great way to explore that through art, through writing, through people's responses in the spaces that we're creating. So um, to get to that stage, to find out if that is a good idea, maybe we do need a show like that in order to figure this out, mm. to, to understand that a bit more. But I'm not really interested in, you know, you know, I came to art because I was trying to escape documentary world where you go into a, a meeting and they'd ask you, so what's your social justice campaign? I'm like, what? I don't, I have a, what? And so, <laughs> but art has suddenly sort of become a little bit like that. They're saying, prescribing that art is political and you're all activists. And, you know, I describe myself as an unactivist and I have real issues with activism for personal reasons, pr mostly, even though you could describe my work as I'm activist sure, yeah, in some way. Sure, yeah. But I don't, but I just can't stand the label and I recoil from it. Um, and so I, s I just feel like we're supposed to use art to, you know, challenge everything even kind of like progressive ideas. We need to use art to like challenge that too. Like, why not? So, um, yeah, I'm interested in art as a tool to explore a lot of these different um, shibboleths. Yeah. I mean, it's also an interesting question because historically, of course, it, it, it would be sort of impossible because women just wouldn't really have the opportunities and you could add more, you know, textiles or things like that. Um, but at least now we've come to a time where it's theoretically possible. There's, you know, lots of women in art schools and lots of women, certainly in the West, anyway, um, with with those opportunities. It's interesting. That I'll just on, on yeah. Um, I I appreciate Gina's gender fluid version of male and female. But I'd like to put this in um, a bigger context, which is that it was Hansa Mehta in 1948 who said to Eleanor Roosevelt, if you say all men are created equal, we are all excluded, those of us who are women. And so the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says all human beings. And that was from Hansa Mehta. And, um, Eleanor Roosevelt was a little slow to accept it, which is really interesting. Mm. And at some point when, you know, 
I was really shocked when Elaine de Kooning, uh, in her interview, which was just on LTV yesterday, said she didn't really care that a women's art museum had been opened. It was irrelevant, she said. Well, many of us don't think that the African American art museum is irrelevant or that the women's art museum, you know, in Washington is irrelevant. It's really wonderful that it exists. Mm -hmm. Just as it's wonderful that women can now go to many of the colleges and law schools from which they were barred until really the 1960s and 70s. Um, Very important, absolutely. Do any of you want to come back on? No, should we, should we try? Do we have any other questions? Gentlemen, um, well, we've got two there. Hi, just addressing the, um, the status of women among the top earning artists, to what degree do you think that's owed in part to the fact that the artist is, is expected to be a performer in some way, as the artist, and it's much higher risk for women to do that, either for family reasons or because they'll be judged much more harshly by creating a persona and putting it out there for everybody to see. Is it more difficult for women? Well, I think it's what I talked before about the closed system. So if you have a male collector and he collects mostly, if you look at a lot of big collections, uh, they're m probably 80 to 90 percent, they collect uh, art, um, art that has been produced by male artists. So that's one big step, which means like the big galleries like um, Gagosian and David Werner, they perpetuate it because they're on the top of the market. And it's the same thing with the auction prices. So it just goes, reaffirms basically a concept they have been driven by. And it's not changing only if, let's say, big collectors decide, well, I'm just going to collect maybe women's art, or I'm going to collect Louise Bourgeois, or I'm going to collect Nancy Sturr and focus my collection on that. But it also plays together with the museums, you know, which museums are willing to give a major retrospective to, to women artists. It's much rarer. So it's, uh, for me, it's a standard. So are you suggesting women are holding, like women aren't leaning in to use the contemporary, that women aren't... aren't, yeah, aren't that they're not creating... The sort that they're not, they're not putting light, themselves out there as much. Putting them out there and right. creating a myth about, about them as people. So There's something about it. the way women are holding back a little bit because of social constraints. Almond, what do you think? <laughs> I disagree. Oh, sorry. sorry, Bastian, do you want to come back on that? I, I don't know that, um, especially an, a, 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 a new generation that's coming up, I don't know that I can subscribe to that. Um, I think that there are plenty of women who, um, I'm not sure that you need to be, you know, a character um, or a performer. I mean, in any, in any public arena that has any sort of, um, you know, system set up, you need to engage in it with some sort of persona, right? I mean, it's a business. So as a business person, and you know, Zena was saying before, as an artist, you have to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a performer, you have to be uh, disciplined and self-reliant, and there are so many things that you have to be as a successful career artist. And even more so now, because the gallery system is such that they are not supporting artists in the way that they used to. The relationship between gallery and artist is much more, um, is, is much less dynamic, I think, than it used to be in terms of supporting and, and nurturing artists' careers. Um, so I think that there are plenty of women that engage on that level very well, you know, um, and I think it's a personal choice for, you know, women across the, the spectrum. Um, I do think those statistics reflect, um, they're like reading stock market, you know, stock market indexes. You know, I, I think that they reflect a very small um, sort of percentage of the art world, a kind of like one percent sort of thing, which, yeah, there are not a lot of women in. And I think it's pure speculation. You know, I think you have to dig down to each sort of individual um, situation um, to to really figure out. I mean, Agnes Martin, she's probably one of the I top sellers, say, yeah, you know, she, yeah. and she was a complete recluse um, that had absolutely no performative, 
you know, so there, I, you know, there's a lot of different. I was, yeah. was going to mention her as someone who has the opposite. I mean, it's a strong, I'm going to use this horrible word, but brand in a sense. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. But if we're talking about brands, you know, it requires collusion. You know, people supporting that, you know. Was, I think you're talking about bad boy artists, and they're totally supported, certainly in the UK, totally supported, or in Italy, or in, in the, or here, totally supported by the people around them. But w bad girl artists, bad girl artists, who are they? So there are bad girl artists, but they're, tr they're treated appallingly. I am so thin-skinned, I could not deal with what Tracy Emin has to deal with. So I don't know if thin-skinned is because I'm female or just because of my character. I don't know. There's like gender, there's personality, it's like dancing between each other. But I do think that, you know, for those of us who are thin-skinned, and there are many of us, you know, if there was support, so your particular personality is drawn out in a particular way, and given architecture, you know, given support, then, you know, lots more different, many more varieties of brands of, of artists could exist. And it does require collusion. It does require respect, actually. It requires, um, it re requires scaffolding. And they have to be willing to give that to you. So, um, yes, there is this thing where, yeah, I, I do get a bit worried about what people, I care very much what my mother thinks, for example. She'll tell me to take something off Instagram. There's a picture of me in Penilla. And she told me to take it off. I took it off. So I do, I do really, really care. It wasn't no, that no, no, bad. No, 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 it wasn't. No. <laughs> I'll describe later if you want to know, but it's not that interesting. But I'm just trying to explain that I am very thin-skinned, and I do care what people think. However, if I was, if I say I had a gallery system around me, and people said, don't worry about this, this is all part of the process, and giving you the kind of the nurturing that that kind of needs. Because even those bad boy artists are extremely thin-skinned as well. And I've seen it. I've seen it. I've got, I have an artist friend who's um, always being attacked, male photographer, always being attacked on so many levels. But I'm also seeing how well he's protected, you know? And so that protection can be afforded to more people, but I think it often isn't. Um, I do think it often isn't for women. I do, I do believe that. Actually, I think there's an interesting phenomenon um, all the women artists, or really old women artists, are cherished, which is interesting yeah. because it means on one hand that women had to work for a really, really long time without any recognition, mm. okay. and they had to be persistent and provide good quality of the work, but also they had to wait their time. And uh, Carmen Herrera, I think she turned 100 or so. Mm. Now she's been recognized. Well, she had to wait for a long time. And it's also, it creates a nice little myth of discovering a woman that has been working in obscurity. Probably she was not obscure. It's probably she didn't find a gallery that was willing to bet on her. Mm. Mm. OK, I think we're going to last question. I, I think I can do that. OK. No. Uh, <laughs> as gender, can you hear me? As gender fluidity has gained a con as gender fluidity has gained an enormous momentum, um, maybe fueled by a younger generation, but giving enormous opportunities to those of us who are older, who have struggled with all sorts of issues, and those of us who haven't struggled but, but are welcoming new opportunities. Since this conversation is about reshaping, what is the intersection between women as artists and what you can and can't have and gender fluidity? How does it reshape this issue? Did everyone hear that? The intersection between um, gender fluidity and, uh, yeah. Right, thank you. It's a really lovely question, actually. A very interesting question. Um, I know I was described as by someone in the audience as being sort of gender fluid. I feel I'm not a millennial. I'm 41 years old, even though I sometimes feel like I'm sometimes. 41 years young. 41 years young. So, I'm, you know, um, so this is also very kind of feels new to me as well, you know, in some ways. And I'm very interested by it. I think I'm approaching the idea. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not really thinking about gender specifically. Honestly, I'm thinking about the, the feminine and masculine archetypes. That's where I'm. That's where I fit in. I feel very traditional and conservative in my desires, anyway, and in, in many ways, to be honest with you. But um, but I've also. I think I'm also struggling trying to imagine how um, certain masculine traits that I might have have impacted the thing. You know how that works within my life, you know, on personal levels and also, like, in terms of my work. So, um, gender fluidity, I'm not, I'm less interested in gender, I'm more interested in, like, male-female archetypes. That's what my interest is. And, because um, that allows for many modalities within it. 
And that's also just more realistic in terms of who we are, you know, and how we operate. Um, Jack Larson has created this garden, this space, and is that a feminine activity or in terms of art? Or is it, what, what is that? Is that male or female? You might think that's not an interesting question, but I'm very interested in how those archetypes work together in this particular enterprise, for example. Mm -hmm. The Guggenheim, you know, as an enterprise. You know, what, are the, what is the interaction between the male and the female archetype in creating that particular institution? So um, gender fluidity is, um, I think that it part, you know, looking at male and female archetypes does impact the idea of gender fluidity, absolutely. It affects your performance as a present male, male presenting or female presenting person. You know, and these are questions we all have to consider and also making the world safe or um, acceptable for people who want to express themselves in all sorts of different ways and how you express gender. But masculine and feminine will affect how you express gender. So um, I know all this terminology, honestly, I get a headache. I can't, re I find it very, very complicated and I'm always terrified of saying the wrong thing. So I'm really sorry if I say the wrong thing. But, um, Does anyone think Zina <laughs> said the wrong thing? I don't know. I don't, maybe I did. Someone will tell you later. I don't know. <laughs> so, but there's gender, and then there's masculine and feminine archetypes, and yes, I think that imp that imply that affects how you perform in terms of your gender. Amon, do you want to talk a little bit about gender fluidity in practice? Well, I think uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think that going back to the idea of freedom in the studio and I, I, I think that these are sort of you know language that's imposed on artists um, and maybe because I am not I am like Zena you know um, and the rest of us are being sort of taught a whole new vo vocabulary and I think it's fabulous um, and um, I'm not sure where I fit into it or where my practice fits into it but I do know that um, you know like I've said um, before during the course of this hour, there's there's a certain amount of freedom and, and freedom from thinking of about language and about uh, defining uh, specific categories to fit myself in. Um, and um, I do there there is a performative aspect of my work, and I I, I do um, enjoy sort of playing on different stereotypes um, and you know, um, locating um, sort of mini private performances within a domestic sphere. And, you know, some people might consider that feminine or, you know, female or I, I don't, but I really don't think about it. And so I, I, I don't know that I have, um, it's not something that I step forward with. So I'm not sure that I have um, much to say that's too profound about about gender fluidity and it uh, what i will say is that uh, um like i will just reiterate i will not locate myself only in one field you know whether it's feminine or masculine female or male like i my work is not anchored to a um that to that um definition so bastian do you want to come back on that one I mean, maybe to close the whole discussion, I think the whole question what is female and male has been really opened as a box uh, for all of us and also as artists. And I think in the end of the day, we all want to be who we are and to take up the freedom and to be who we are. I think that's the most important thing, authentically. That is a nice way to end. I'd love to say one thing. I feel very conscious that we've got three fantastic artists up here whose work we haven't actually looked at because we're without images and I would really encourage you all to seek out all three of these artists work um, I think there's a lot of possibilities online I know Bastian has a book coming out Zina's in lots of shows Almond as well um, so I would really encourage you to take a look at their wonderful works as well um, and thank you very much for coming today and for all the great questions and thank you again Tony Once again, I feel really practically moved to tears um, by, this, by this series, and I'm profoundly grateful to all of you. Um, I, I hope that, th I, what's extraordinary to me about all three uh, conversation is the candor and intimacy with which you've all spoken and the previous panelists have so spoken before. 
And I believe that part of that is being here in this space at Longhouse in this particular spot. And um, I, as I was sitting listening, I was remembering that my piece is entitled Sanctuary Entwined. And the, in, the thought behind it was about what does make us feel safe. And so I feel uh, very moved that you felt safe enough to have these conversations here. Um, I thank everybody, and I just want to uh, remind you that there's 30% off at the store uh, on your way out of Longhouse, and this is one of the beautiful pieces. Um, you're welcome to wander and um, go inside the work, um, talk to the artists a little bit, and um, I thank you so very much.